Roman Curia. The Roman Curia isn't exactly a secret, but it's certainly not something the Vatican advertises openly. In fact, most people don't even know the Roman Curia exists. Some call them the Curia Romanae, some simply the Curia. But whatever name you like the most, they're still the cabinet that looks over all the official business in the Vatican. They are, in essence, the Vatican's government. If the Pope is the President, the Roman Curia is the Senate. There are nine main departments known as congregations, the oldest of which was founded in 1542. It's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it was originally the office of the Inquisition. Almost 500 years later, their mission remains exactly the same. They are charged with safeguarding the religious doctrine and maintaining the orthodoxy of the Church. Each department handles something very specific. Some oversee liturgy, some are responsible for the canonization of saints, and some choose the new bishops. But the Roman Curia is much deeper than just a couple of different congregations. There are also tribunals, like the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Penitentiary, responsible for the forgiveness of sin. And finally, there are many offices and three secretaries for promoting Christian unity, for non-Christians and for non-believers. Several enduring directives reflect papal direction for scholarly studies. They include the Pontifical Commission for Biblical Studies and the Pontifical Commission for the Revision of the Code of Canon Law. The Vatican may look like a simple organization of the top Catholic brass, but the entire structure is a very real government, one which pulls a lot of unseen strings in the world. The King Pope the Pope isn't merely a man who occasionally says things out of a very tall window, he's actually the king of his own country. He's the leader of the smallest nation in the world, the head of government and the supreme leader, the all-powerful monarch of Vatican City. This is something not many people know, that Vatican City is itself by definition an independent country. One reason the Vatican doesn't keep the public educated on its official origins is that they're kind of uncertain. Back in 1929, the Vatican made a deal with the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. This was the tyrant who went to war against the world on Hitler's side, trying to recreate the Roman Empire. Until 1871, Italy was divided into a bunch of different states. One of them was the Papal Lands, covering a massive third of Italy, and it was ruled by the Pope. When Italy finally became a country, the Pope lost a huge amount of territory and his power started to dwindle. This obviously didn't sit well with the rulers of the Vatican, as they had been enjoying pretty much unquestionable power for centuries. On February 11, 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed by Mussolini and Pope Pius XI. The treaty was a kind of mutually beneficial deal for the two parties. The Vatican would stay out of the political decisions of Italy, and Italy would have absolutely no power over the Vatican because it would finally be an independent country. This worked out well for Mussolini when Italy went to war with the fascists, and the Pope had to stay silent about the politics of the war, otherwise he could lose control of his fine kingdom. Much of Vatican City is concealed by walls and difficult to enter as a non-citizen or invited guest. If you manage to step onto St. Peter's Square, you will be in the smallest country in the world. To really get inside the Vatican borders and visit the Vatican Museum, you won't have to deal with immigration officers, but you will have to go through tight security. The Vatican Economy Nobody knows exactly how much money the Vatican has, but we know that it's a lot. The smallest country in the world has one of the largest impacts on the global financial system out of any other governing body. Investments, private enterprise, banking deals, real estate, and so much more. The economy of the Vatican is wildly complicated and hugely secret. It also has a lot to do with the Pope himself or the Holy See. Seeing as he is the ruler of Vatican City, he's the one who technically controls all their money. The church's revenue is generated from something called Peter's Pence, which was a term that came around in the 8th century. From individual people and churches all across the globe, the Holy See collects its cash through donations. Every time someone puts a bit of money in a donation box, that money goes directly under the Pope's control. 
The Pope then takes this money that's been donated to the church and delegates it to be invested. The investment portfolio is spread between stocks and bonds. Western European currencies and real estate are also held within the portfolio. The church is even active in the New York Stock Exchange. There are some investment opportunities that the Holy See won't make. For example, it will not make investments in businesses that go against church values, such as pharmaceutical companies that manufacture birth control. In this regard, the Holy See's investment strategy is similar to those that employ a faith-based investing policy. Treasure in the Dungeon According to some experts in ancient history, biblical treasure stolen from Jerusalem's Second Temple by the Romans in the year 70 could be hidden underneath the Vatican to this very day. These mysterious treasures could be held in a secret vault inside the Vatican dungeons, away from prying eyes and kept totally secret. We already know the Vatican is home to one of the most spectacular collections of historical texts anywhere in the world. There are over 35,000 volumes of mysterious information spread across 53 miles, 85 kilometers of shelves inside their secret archives. But according to Tom Meyer, a biblical studies professor from California, there could be actual treasure stashed away underneath the Vatican, not just paper and secrets. This treasure was pillaged from Judea after the Roman Emperor Titus slaughtered roughly one million Jewish people. The Romans torched the great religious buildings in Jerusalem and stole all the artifacts. And while we don't know for sure, it makes sense that those artifacts could have, over time, found their way into the powerful hands of the Vatican. And if so, they certainly might have been stashed underground in a hidden vault, a place that's legitimately secret, somewhere you won't typically hear about in an internet video. The Vatican Murders On May 4, 1998, Alois Esterman and his wife Gladys Meza Romero were killed in their apartment where they lived in Vatican City. Alois had been the newly commissioned commander of the famous Swiss Guard, appointed to his position just a few hours before his death. He was killed by a gunshot wound to the face. As for his wife, a native of Venezuela, she was killed by a bullet through her chest. But these weren't the only bodies discovered in the apartment. There was also the alleged perpetrator, a guardsman by the name of Cedric Tournay, who had died from a gunshot wound to the head. The day after the incident, the supreme seller of Vatican truths came before the media and told them what happened. They said that an internal investigation revealed Cedric Tournay had been upset with Alois Esterman. Alois was his superior, and he had disciplined him for leaving Vatican City one night without permission. Because of this disciplinary action, Cedric was not awarded a Medal of Merit. Angry about the entire ordeal, he killed Alois and his wife, then turned the gun on himself. But this is just what the Vatican says. The truth is that they never brought in the Italian law enforcement. They also didn't wait for forensic results or an autopsy. It was almost as if they had already come up with a story to tell the news beforehand. Investigations later on proved that Alois Esterman had some pretty deep connections in the Vatican, and it was rumored there were some who didn't want him climbing any higher up the ladder. Whatever the case, this murder mystery was technically solved by the Vatican less than 24 hours after it happened. It's just that, over 20 years later, few people believe the official story. What do you think happened in that apartment? Let me know in the comments. Remember to hit the subscribe button before the end of the video. Blessed are the poor. Peter's Pence is the tradition from the 8th century when all Catholics are instructed to donate to the church. Often the donations are advertised as going towards something charitable. It's like when a fast food joint asks you to donate one dollar to some children's charity. But that gut instinct telling you the money isn't going where they're saying may not be wrong. In 2019, journalists broke the case of the Vatican misappropriating funds wide open. A Wall Street Journal investigation found out that as little as 10% of donations that are specifically advertised as going towards charitable work reach those in need. The other 90% of the cash goes to the church, which is then used to budget the Vatican's deficit. This was a pretty big blow to the Pope when the news broke. Basically, churches all over the world ask people for money to help the poor. But instead of giving all the money that they collect to those poor people, they use some of the money to keep the electricity on in their churches. But how else is a church supposed to pay the bills other than donations? What do you think? 
the Pope's Swiss Guard. In the year 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V had just conquered the French, but he had a major problem. Charles didn't have enough money to pay his army of 34,000 standing men. The soldiers were furious, and so they started to march on Rome. These soldiers wanted payment, and they were going to get it by sacking and pillaging the Papal States. On May 6, 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor's underpaid Imperial Army looted Rome and caused havoc inside the city for 12 days. The only defense Rome had was the city's 5,000-man strong militia and 189 members of the Pope's Swiss Guard. The last stand was made at the Vatican, and every last defender of Rome died, except for 40 Swiss Guards who made it their duty to escort Pope Clement VII to safety. Even though the Vatican was defeated, the Imperial Army was utterly torn to shreds. While that many deaths seem like a disturbing loss for the Swiss Guards, consider that the elite unit crushed the fighting force of the Imperial Army by three quarters. Of the 20,000 troops that stormed the city of Rome, 15,000 were killed or injured by the city's guardians. Basically, the Pope's warriors turned out to be even tougher than Leonidas's 300 Spartans. A lot of property. The Pope controls not only all of Vatican City, along with who knows how many investment properties across the world, but the Church also owns some pretty unexpected pieces of property. For example, the Holy See owns the Scala Sancta, a set of 28 marble steps that lead up to the Lateran Basilica in Rome. Catholics believe these are the stairs that Jesus walked in Jerusalem as he went to his trial. The fact that the Holy See owns such an important religious sanctuary is pretty major, but that's not all. The Church also owns the Apostolic Palace, a massive chunk of real estate in Italy, and the old residence of Emperor Domitian. In 1596, the Pope had the property purchased, and it's been used as a vacation home for the leaders of the Vatican ever since. The place is gorgeous, and pretty much only used when one of the Popes wants to take a bit of a break. But perhaps the weirdest thing the Church owns is the Mount Graham International Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. For an organization that long ago persecuted scientists and killed anyone willing to discuss the intricacies of the universe, it might seem a little weird for them to own their very own observatory. The Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope was completed in 1993, and the observatory is still one of the leading astrological sites in the United States of America. I suppose the Church had a change of heart about science and the universe. Major crime. One thing you won't see in the Vatican brochures is their crime rate. As the smallest country in the world, the Vatican has one of the highest crime rates per capita. If you look at the figures, the Vatican is the most dangerous place to go for non-violent crimes. Yet, how can this be when the Vatican is home to only about 1,000 residents, most of which are nuns and priests for the Catholic Church? Well, it's all about the tourists. There are about 18 million visitors who cross the border into Vatican City each year. And because there are so many tourists, you can expect there to be heaps of crime. The Vatican has a crime rate of about 1 to 1.5 crimes committed per person every year. What that means is that, on average, every person who visits the Vatican is going to commit at least one or one and a half crimes. And while that may sound scary, the truth is that it's really just a lot of pickpockets and minor criminals shoplifting and stealing wallets. According to Crime and Punishment Worldwide, roughly 90% of these crimes are never prosecuted. Tons of gold. The International Business Times reported in 2014 that the Vatican had somewhere around $20 million in gold reserves being kept in the US Federal Reserve. That's a lot of gold for the church to be holding onto. But gold is hardly where the money's at these days. Besides all that priceless yellow, the Vatican has about $764 million in equity across their accounts, and they manage somewhere around $64 billion in global assets. The Vatican is also rumored to have a large store of gold reserve throughout the world, kept in various countries for safekeeping. We don't know exactly how much gold the Vatican has, but it's certainly more than most people are hiding in their jewelry boxes. Considering their gold reserves, the countless artifacts they have that are basically giant gold blocks, and whatever else they're keeping stashed away, most experts believe they have about $50 million in total worth of solid gold. 
Even if the banking systems fail globally, the Vatican will still be filthy rich because of its gold reserves. They've been stockpiling the stuff for about 2,000 years. It's less difficult now to locate information about the Vatican's funds thanks to recent reforms made by the Pope concerning the Vatican's finances, but the evidence is still not easy to come by. One thing we know for sure is the Vatican has tons of gold. Which of these wild Vatican secrets shocked you the most? The Possessed Nun Maria Crocafisa della Concessione was a nun living at the Sicilian convent of Parma de Montechiaro back in 1676. On August 11th, the 31-year-old woman woke up splattered with ink and holding a mysterious note covered in an incomprehensible script of symbols and letters. Historical records say that Sister Maria told everyone the letter was written by the devil who had entered her body through possession. This mysterious evil message remained a jumble of nonsense for centuries. Nobody ever managed to decode the 14 lines of mysterious script until the 2010s. Finally, Daniel Abati and his team of researchers used special software to identify the various characters used in the nun's letter. It was a jumble of words from Greek, Latin, Arabic, and even ancient runic. But the actual translation is still quite confusing. It sounds like a crazy person's ramblings. Sister Maria wrote that the Holy Trinity was dead weight. She wrote something about God thinking he can free mortals, and she wrote a bewildering passage about the river Styx from Greek mythology. The translation of the letter has proved to be so bizarre that the researchers believe Sister Maria suffered from schizophrenia. She must have had a deep knowledge of ancient languages, which came out during a manic episode. It's unlikely she was actually possessed by the devil, but was mentally unstable and knew nothing except religion, and so her letter was filled with religious ramblings. But this was the 1600s, and anyone who displayed mental abnormalities back then was usually accused of being possessed by one devil or another. The House of the Apostles an ancient church has been discovered near the Sea of Galilee in Israel, and researchers believe the remains of a house found underneath it may have once been the home of the Christian apostles Peter and Andrew, two of the men pictured in the Last Supper. A group of excavators from all over the world made the discovery in June of 2019. The church was constructed during the Byzantine period and has been nicknamed the Church of the Apostles. Records from 725 AD, when the Bavarian bishop named Willibald passed through the area, show that there was a large church standing there. It was supposedly a basilica that had been constructed over the house that Peter and Andrew shared. For those unfamiliar with the story, Peter and Andrew were the first disciples of Jesus Christ. They had been fishing out on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus first asked him to join his ministry. And this buried house may very well have been where they actually lived 2,000 years ago. Christian Martyrs The Christian saints Chrysanthus and Daria have been legends for centuries, but according to new evidence, these Christian martyrs may have actually been real people living in the 3rd century AD. Just like the legend says, they may have converted thousands of Romans to Christianity before being arrested by the authorities and buried alive in a sand pit. The evidence comes in the form of skeletal human remains discovered in 2008. These bones were recovered from the Cathedral of the Reggio Emilio family in northern Italy during renovations. Workers found over 150 bones hidden underneath the altar in a sealed crypt. The bones belonged to only two skeletons, the shattered bodies of two men who had been trapped down there since 1651. Whoever these guys were, they were extremely important since their skulls were found packed inside gold and silver containers deep in the vault. Scientists ran multiple tests on the skeletal remains as one of the first comprehensive investigations into the bones of alleged Christian saints. The church cooperated and everyone was very excited to actually prove for the first time in history the bones of living, breathing martyrs existed. And sure enough, carbon dating showed the skeletons died somewhere around 283 AD and they suffered major lead poisoning. This was pretty common in ancient Rome, since lead was everywhere from the food to the wine. 
but the tests also showed that one skeleton belonged to a woman and the other to a man. They were both the exact ages that Chrysanthus and Daria were when they died. And so, all the evidence points to these saintly legends having been very real people. The discovery has made scientists a little shocked, because if the story of Chrysanthus and Daria is true, how many more biblical tales might be rooted in reality? The Demon Pazuzu Almost all of the great demons of ancient Mesopotamia have faded into the history books. Horrifying creatures like the demon Humbaba no longer strike fear into the hearts of the living. But there is one demon that's still around today, a demon by the name of Pazuzu that somehow managed to sneak its way into popular culture in the 21st century. Ancient texts describe Pazuzu as the son of Hanbu and the king of all the wind demons. He is depicted as a rather ugly monster that stands on two legs, has claws for hands, a double pair of wings, the tail of a scorpion, male genitalia twisted into the form of a snake, and the head of a beast with horns and a snarling dog mouth. Roughly 3,000 years ago, the people of Mesopotamia wore amulets with his picture on them, and in 1973, Pazuzu was the demon who possessed a 12-year-old girl in the movie The Exorcist. There have been more statues, amulets, and bronze pendants found depicting Pazuzu than almost any other demon in history. There's a stone plaque of Pazuzu from Mesopotamia in the 8th or 6th century BC held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, along with a bronze head of Pazuzu crafted around the same time, also found in ancient Mesopotamia. The Holy Prepuce The Holy Prepuce, or the Holy Foreskin, is exactly what it sounds like. This bizarre Christian relic is supposedly the leftover of Jesus Christ's circumcision. According to the legends, because Jesus was born as a Jewish boy, he was circumcised at eight days old, and his foreskin was then kept as a treasure all the way into the Middle Ages. In fact, there were no less than a dozen churches across Western Europe that claimed to hold a piece of this holy relic. Nobody knows if this thing actually survived into the Middle Ages or which church really owned it. But one of the alleged foreskin relics came into the possession of Pope Leo III in the year 799, given as a gift by King Charlemagne. It then remained in the Sancta Sanctorum in Rome up until the city was attacked in 1527 by the troops of Charles V. After Rome was invaded and half the population was slaughtered, most of the holy relics were either destroyed or scattered. Thirty years later, the holy prepuce supposedly surfaced in the small village of Calcutta. Historical documents show that the Pope even confirmed the relic to be real and decreed that it would stay in the village for the rest of time. It was housed in the Church of the Holy Name. And every year on January 1st, a local priest would lead a procession around the village while holding on to this rather disgusting piece of holy treasure. This lasted until 1983. Just weeks before the annual procession was to happen, the relic was reported missing. Some say the Vatican took it back to hold in their secret archives, while others believe it was stolen by a group of Satanists. Another theory is that it was taken and sold on the black market. Whatever the case, the Holy Prepuce has been missing ever since. What do you think happened to the Holy Prepuce? Do you believe it even existed? Let me know in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Demon Burials In a Polish cemetery, archaeologists came across five skeletons that had been buried in a barbaric and bizarre fashion. These five individuals had been put into the ground with sickles placed at their throats. This was actually an obscure burial practice that researchers believe was meant to protect the dead from demons chasing them into the afterlife. Either that, or the sickles were meant to prevent the death from rising out of their graves and tormenting the living. Excavations at the ancient Dravsko Cemetery began back in 2008, and even though researchers have found graves from the Bronze Age, these creepy demon burials date back to around 400 years ago. One of the victims was a man who died around the age of 35. Another was a woman around the same age who had her skull completely crushed, likely because of farming that took place over the graves centuries after she was buried. There was another woman found buried with no teeth, a coin in her mouth, and a rock on her throat. 
Researchers say this particularly strange grave suggests the woman was likely considered a witch. Unfortunately, the archaeologists can't completely agree on what the sickle in the graves truly meant to these medieval people. But it definitely has something to do with demons, either to protect the dead from demons or to protect the living from the dead turning into demons. Jesus's twin brother. Professor Dale Martin from Yale University recently revealed the bizarre theory that Jesus actually had a twin brother and that his name was Didymus Judas Thomas. The professor says that Jesus' brother's real name was probably Judas and that Didymus and Thomas had just been nicknames. That's interesting because the word Didymus is Greek for twin, and of course also because Judas was the man who sold Jesus out to the Romans as a betrayer. But here's what a lot of people don't know. There's actually a strand of Christianity that's been popular for hundreds of years called Thomasine Christianity, and it flourished in the Middle East where they treated the Apostle Thomas with quite a bit of reverence. Many of the Thomasine Christians think Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus, which makes him almost just as important as Christ himself. But like so many things from the Bible, this is really just a theory. Orthodox Christians don't believe Jesus had any siblings, and that Didymus Judas Thomas was only a complex nickname for Thomas, who was actually a twin brother of some other unknown character. Then again, there's also the opinion that Thomas and Jesus were indeed brothers, but in a more spiritual, divine way than being bound by blood. The Body of Saint Dacian There is a corpse in a Manhattan church that was put there to avoid being stolen by the Italian government. It's the body of Saint Dacian, an obscure Roman martyr. It's not actually his whole body, but his skeleton that's been contained inside of a wax replica of his body, which is almost worse than if it were just his bones on display. The thing about Saint Dacian is that nobody really knows who he was. We don't know when he died, we don't know why he was such an important martyr, and we're not even sure where his bones came from. All we know is that in 1892, they were kept in the private chapel of a wealthy Italian woman. But when she ran out of money to keep her private chapel going, the Italian government moved in to seize her belongings, including the bones of her saint. To avoid the bones being thrown out with the trash, she donated them to the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer in Manhattan. The bones were shipped there and are still on display in the small church, along with a trove of treasures from over 150 various saints. Jesus on Ice Most of us are familiar with the story of Jesus walking on water. If you're not sure of all the specific details, they can be found in the New Testament, where it describes Jesus walking across the surface of the Sea of Galilee as one of his miracles. But according to a new and shocking study done by Professor Doran Knopf at Florida State University, that probably never happened. The professor says that instead of walking on water, Jesus probably walked on an isolated patch of ice, thereby tricking the locals into thinking he could do miracles. It all has to do with a localized freezing phenomenon brought on by water and atmospheric conditions. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for small patches of ice to form on the freshwater surface of the sea. Between 2,500 and 1,500 years ago, there were two prolonged periods of extreme cold. And when one of these cold snaps hit, small, nearly invisible slivers of ice could be found on the edge of the sea. Researchers now believe Jesus had probably figured this out himself and had walked across a patch of very thin floating ice that nobody knew was there. This would have given the illusion that he really was walking across water. The Relics of Muhammad The relics of Muhammad are like the Islamic version of the holy relics of Jesus. These relics were supposed things that belonged to the Islamic prophet Muhammad thousands of years ago and are kept at various mosques and mausoleums across the modern Islamic world. There's the sacred seal kept in a small ebony box in Topkapi, Turkey, supposedly used by Muhammad himself when writing documents. There's the blessed sandals that were supposedly worn by Muhammad, and four of his teeth that were knocked out of his head during the Battle of Uhud, 
when he was struck by a battle axe. There are multiple supposed footprints of Muhammad preserved in plaster. One of them is at the Ayyub Sultan Mosque complex in Istanbul. But perhaps strangest of all is the beard of Muhammad, which was supposedly shaved from his face by his favorite barber, and all these years later is still kept in a glass case. Tarred and feathered. In 1765, the British colonists living in North America rejected the taxes the British government tried to impose. It was the beginning of what would become the United States of America's great freedom. The colonists realized they could decide their own taxes to pay to their own government instead of handing over their money to the British Parliament. After all, why should they give their money to a government on the other side of the ocean? At the time all this was going on, Boston was one of the biggest cities in North America. It became the center of protests against the British government. The main group of protesters were called the Sons of Liberty, later known as Patriots. Those who supported the British government were called Loyalists. In 1767, the British government raised taxes on tea. Then in 1773, the Tea Act was passed to enforce the taxes that weren't being paid by colonists. This led to even more protests. And finally, on December 16, 1773, history changed forever. Tea became a symbol of oppression, and demonstrators in Boston had had enough. In a rage, they destroyed a ship loaded with English tea. This political protest went down in history as the Boston Tea Party. But here's one of the weirdest events that took place during this whole revolution. In January of 1774, Patriots in Boston captured a Loyalist and customs official by the name of John Malcolm. They were so sick of the Loyalists that, to send a message, they tarred and feathered him. They stripped him down to the waist, soaked him in tar, threw feathers all over him, and then forced him to apologize for his behavior and denounce King George III. After this, John Malcolm got on a boat and moved to England. The Egyptian Strike The first recorded strike in human history happened sometime between 1170 and 1152 BC. For two decades before the beginning of the strike, the great king Ramesses III had done his best for the Egyptian people, and as he approached his 30th birthday, the Egyptians started making plans for a great festival in his honor. But trouble had already been brewing. Three years before the festival, monthly wages of tomb builders who had worked on the Place of Truth were given to them late. There had been some confusing negotiations between scribes and workers to get the tomb builders compensation while they were forced to wait for real payment. But it only got worse and worse, and eventually the entire system of payment for the necropolis builders broke down. The workers waited 18 days and then refused to wait any longer. They laid down their tools and marched through the city. They shouted that they were hungry, they held demonstrations in front of the mortuary temple of Ramses III, and even staged a sit-in at the temple of Thutmose III. Egyptian authorities had no idea how to deal with such an event, as never in the course of human history had such a thing happened. The government ultimately had no choice but to give rations and payments to the workers, who then returned to their labor. It was such a successful tactic that historians believe it continued to be used throughout the rest of the reign of King Ramses III. Napoleon's Fight Against Murderous Rabbits The great French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated in an epically humiliating fashion at Waterloo on June 18, 1850. It was the final defeat of the French army, but not Napoleon's only indignity. He also got into a battle with some rabbits that nearly left him dead in the summer of 1807. Napoleon had just signed the treaties of Tilsit to end the War of the Fourth Coalition. To celebrate, he went on a rabbit hunt. He had his chief of staff collect the bunnies. Napoleon invited the most prominent men in his military. Then hundreds and some say thousands of bunnies were released from their cages for the men to hunt. Napoleon and the men had expected the rabbits to run away in terror, but instead, a mob of rampaging bunnies hopped straight towards Napoleon. The crowd was laughing nervously, 
but then they began to shriek in horror as it was clear Napoleon was in some kind of danger. The bunny started hopping up his legs and swarming him with clearly evil intent. Of course, Napoleon was never actually in any danger of being killed by the rabbits, but it was humiliating because when he failed to beat the rabbits off his legs and they just kept coming, he ran away. Napoleon literally fled from a throng of tamed rabbits and hid like a coward in his carriage until they finally left. In front of all his generals and all the most important people in France, Napoleon ran away from the rabbits like a terrified child. The Salem Tomato Trial 200 years ago, tomatoes were considered evil. Eating tomatoes was considered sinful by the church and an obstacle to reaching salvation. The history of the tomato in Europe goes back to about 1519 when it's believed the famous Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes, the man who conquered the Aztec, brought the seeds back to southern Europe. Then throughout the 16th century, Europeans didn't eat tomatoes so much as they grew them for ornamental display. In the 1700s, people actually feared that eating tomatoes would kill them. They thought the fruit was poisonous, even though that's obviously not the case. The truth was that people's tableware contained significantly high lead content, and the acidity in the tomatoes brought out the poison and killed people. But of course, medieval Europeans couldn't exactly put two and two together, and so they entirely blamed the evil tomato. The tomato's reputation grew worse and worse until the year 1820. That was when a man named Robert Gibbon Johnson participated in the Salem Tomato Trial in New Jersey. The entire point of the trial was to prove once and for all that tomatoes could be eaten as ordinary food. So, a large group of people were brought to the courthouse in Salem, where Robert took the stand with a basket of fresh tomatoes. To prove his point, he sat there and ate the entire basket of fruit. The crowd was expecting a violent sudden death, but that death never came. Robert lived, the myth of the evil tomato was debunked, and from then on it became a widely accepted food. If any fruit had to go on trial, which do you think would be most evil and deserving? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe before the end of the video. Unsinkable Sam All kinds of bizarre things happened during World War II, but one of the weirdest that most people haven't heard of involves a cat. The cat was originally named Oscar, but became known as Unsinkable Sam because he was on board three ships that sank and managed to survive each time. Unsinkable Sam began his naval career in the Nazi fleet on board the Kriegsmarine, but he ended up working for the British. He was on board the legendary Nazi ship the Bismarck when it sank, then the HMS Cossack, and finally the HMS Ark Royal. It was a weird coincidence because the HMS Ark Royal was crucial in sinking the Bismarck. It was almost like wherever the cat went, the boat sank. Following the war, the cat lived a long life until 1955. He was so famous that the artist Georgina Shaw Baker created a pastel portrait of Sam that's still hanging at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. The Very Bad Surgeon In the 19th century, Dr. Robert Liston was considered the finest surgeon of his day. He was famous for his lightning-fast amputations, but ultimately went down in history as a miserable failure. Before his grave mistake, he had an almost flawless record. Only about one out of ten of Liston's patients died on the operating table, which was considered impeccable for the day. The doctor was so fast with his amputations that he let his speed get the better of him. He performed an operation so quickly that as he was slashing with his knife, he accidentally cut his assistant's fingers when he sliced through the patient's leg. And in the same careless motion, he slashed through the coat of one of the spectators. The patient and the assistant both died from infections. The spectator that had been slashed through the coat was so scared that he had been stabbed that he literally dropped dead of shock. To this day, the doctor's botched amputation is the only known surgery to boast a 300% mortality rate. He went in trying to heal one person and ended up killing three of them. The Mutiny on the HMS Bounty In 1789, just three weeks into a journey from Tahiti to the West Indies, 
A mutiny took over the HMS Bounty. The vessel was seized by the master's mate, Fletcher Christian. The captain, William Bly, and 18 of his supporters were set adrift in a boat, and the mutineers set a course for Tubai, near Tahiti. It wasn't the most unusual thing to happen in the 1700s, but it was a pretty extreme uprising. Why would the crew do this? It's because they were sick of working and wanted to live a nice, quiet life with the Tahitians. Why would they want to spend the rest of their lives working on a stinky old boat, going back and forth across the world when they could just turn around and go back to Tahiti and enjoy the lush scenery, the lovely hospitality, and the laziness of island life? Well, that's pretty much what the mutineers did. They sailed to the island of Tubuai and tried to set up their very own colony, but it was an utter failure and they had no choice but to sail back to Tahiti. They stayed there for a short while, but were worried that the British authorities would come back and arrest them. So Fletcher Christian and eight other men, along with a dozen Tahitian women, sailed around the South Pacific looking for their own island paradise. They found it on Pitcairn Island. It's an isolated volcanic island about a thousand miles, 1,609 kilometers, from Tahiti where the mutineers lived in total isolation. They weren't discovered until 1808, when an American whaling vessel was drawn to the island by the smoke from their cooking fires. A man named John Adams was leading the group, the only survivor of the original mutineers. According to what John told the Americans, all the original settlers died on the island by contracting weird diseases. John Adams was the only one to survive, and he went on to serve basically as the king of Pitcairn Island until 1829. There is still a community of the mutineers' descendants living on the island to this day. Flower Sack Fashion Here's something you may not know about the Great Depression. Times were so lean in the 1930s that companies began making flower sacks with colorful patterns. The colorful patterns were for women who actually made dresses out of the flower sacks because nobody could afford to purchase real clothing or buy real materials. It started when the manufacturers of flour learned women were using the sacks, which happened to be made of cotton for all kinds of usable goods for their families. They made kids' clothing out of flour sacks. They used them as diapers for dishcloths and pretty much anything else. It was basically free fabric, and so, to help out families, the company started packaging the flour with pretty patterns. The ink of the labels was easily washed off, and then the sacks could be used like normal chunks of fabric. And this was only 90 years ago. Even though you can walk into a Walmart and buy a shirt and some pants for $5 today, it might not always be so easy. Just like people from the Great Depression, we could all end up wearing flower sacks a few years down the road. The Weird Death of King George V Just before midnight on January 20th, 1936, King George had one of the strangest deaths in English royal history. His health had been declining in the previous months because of a chronic lung issue that first reared its ugly head in 1928. But it wouldn't be until 1986 that the diary of the king's physician, Lord Bertrand Dawson, came to public light. In the physician's journal, he clearly describes how he decided to kill the king himself with an injection of morphine and cocaine straight into his jugular vein. It was considered euthanasia, yet the king hadn't anything to say about it. According to what Dawson wrote in his journal, he wanted to grant the king a painless death, even though he hadn't agreed to it. He also wanted to kill him at night so that his death would be in the morning paper instead of in the evening journals, which were considered less savory at the time. In other words, the king was technically murdered by his own physician simply so it would appear in the morning's newspaper, and nobody found out about it for 50 years. The Duke and the Wine Barrel George Plantagenet, first Duke of Clarence, was an English nobleman from the 15th century. Just like King George V 500 years later, the Duke of Clarence also perished under extremely unusual circumstances. He died by being thrown into a vat of wine. The bizarre death came because of an equally bizarre scheme by the Duke to steal the throne for himself. His brother, Edward IV, had become the first English king from the House of York in 1461, after the death of Henry VI. George wanted that power for himself. 
George and one of his conspirators, named John Stacy, were caught plotting to overthrow the king by using the black arts. This was a serious crime, and George was arrested in 1477 and imprisoned. In 1478, he was executed by being dunked into a barrel of wine. At least, that's the historical rumor. We don't have any real proof that he was killed in a wine barrel, but that's what historians generally agree happened. It was a far cry from the usual beheading that went with a charge of treason against the king. Thanks for watching. Which one of these historical events shocked you the most? Let me know in the comments below, and if you haven't yet, remember to subscribe to help support the channel. I'll see you again soon for more of history's craziest secrets. Bye.